Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool. And have I got a special guest lined up for you this week? She's been badgering me a lot because she's a very pushy person. But but even even on the conversation from the railway station to this to the venue where we're recording this podcast in Oxford, she's told me the most amazing things about herself, which makes me think that she is going to be a fantastic guest. So welcome to the podcast, Catherine Blakelock. Thank you. Um, you're a woman of many parts, aren't you, Catherine? I mean, you're currently... UKIP's economic spokesman. So you've written the, the economic policy of UKIP? Um, well, I was made that about three or four weeks ago. Mm. Um, I only came into politics in a serious way the day after Brexit. Everybody else, of course, came in the day before. Yeah, before. yeah. Um, I had joined um, I had joined UKIP in 2014, but had done absolutely nothing. I originally saw Nigel Farage coming through. I worked in financial markets, and I started seeing him on the internet, this extraordinary man in Strasbourg and Brussels and that's how I I mean I came really from the economic background but um, I had never voted prior to 2015 um, I had no interest really in politics my my background was economics I'd lived and worked all over the world um, and then I saw what Merkel did and I went goodness this is a disaster this is absolutely crazy and I knew that from um, having a Nepalese husband and running a Nepalese healthcare that every single Nepalese person, all 30 million of them, would arrive in Britain. I knew there were Nepalese in that crowd of people. Um, And I also knew that my nurses, I set up a healthcare charity in Nepal, um, in the Himalayas at about 10,000 feet. I founded and funded it and then set it up as a charity. My nurses had never been to the capital city. Now they were the educated middle class and they'd never been to the capital city. Um, so I knew who would be coming and I knew I'd also been to Ethiopia and all sorts of other countries and I knew that basically everybody would come if they could get here. Well, it's steady. I mean, I, I, I'd, surely the worry uh, of when people worry about immigration, mm. they don't worry about too many upper, upper class Nepalese coming over, do they? They worry about other other people. Well... Um, I, th- I think that it, it's, it would, everybody would come. That's the whole point. I mean, once, once a few people work out how to do things, then everybody follows on. So a villager totally. would follow on and sell their land or mortgage their house or send the older son um, as, a, as a means to, to, to that. Um, I mean, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Even in Jamaica, my current husband is Jamaican. Um, uh, you know, all of those people would come. Totally. Um, if they could come. Well, you were saying, because okay, uh, we, we, we've got far too much information in that first, um, yes. in that first burst. Uh, so I want to slow down a bit. But you were telling me about your journey, mm. your political journey, that actually you started out as a kind of globalist, as a, as a lefty. You, 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 you I, believed I would, in all things I leftists do. I would never do. say I was a lefty, but I was an apolitical person. Right. Um, I certainly had this um, idea about um, poverty. I I went to Christchurch in Oxford and I'd come out of the care system and I was sort of fed a... um, I did exactly the same course as Theresa May, actually. Um, You're a geographer. I'm a geographer. I have to to say, I I, I don't despise (laughs) geographers. I just think that when when you hear that Theresa May went to Oxford, you think, well quite clever and then you hear she read geography mm. and you think well I know the people who went to Oxford to do geography in my day which is which is okay a bit after Theresa's time mm. and they weren't necessarily the brightest and best you however to come from a care home yeah to Christchurch that must have been quite a weird experience yeah I mean I was the and I would probably suggest I'm the only person still even 30 years later who came out of the care system so aged 14 I was in a place which was the if you between myself and Holloway for a girl there was nowhere else Holloway Um, prison you mean yes (laughs) right yes um, I was. Um, I essentially got put into care because um, I had bulimia, not because. Uh, and, and my parents considered me wayward and difficult, and so I was put into care. And I then went into foster parents, and I went to in various um, sort of uh, oh 
they weren't detention centres, but they were the, in the care system. Blimey. So um, I, you know, was with drug dealers and people who were there for having underage sex and, and car thieves and all sorts of people. Well, how did you get on in that world? Well, I became very practical. <laughs> in, in, in what way? I understood who my enemies were. I understood um, how to survive. Yes, um, I imagine you did. What, what, what were the survival techniques you learned? I mean, apart from being able to, I imagine you got quite good at reading situations. Yes, and I also knew, I happened while I was there to watch a program about Radley College. Oh, yeah. On TV. And yeah. which, which, is a, which is a, a, a private school for the American listener. Yes, yeah. and I was um, at a state comprehensive. So not, I, I was at a state comprehensive, and I thought, this is my way out. At that point, I had originally thought of... I was also a year ahead at school, so I had thought of dropping out. So I had to actually stay at school for a year, when I, between 15 and 16, because mm. I couldn't leave till I was 16. So they said, well, you've already got 10 O-levels, so just do the first year of A level um, because you might, you've just got to sit around and wait for a year and it was during that year that I watched this program and I thought goodness that is a life and I'd like some of that that's a different world yeah so when you were when you were a sort of street urchin as it were <laughs> did you have a, a, a London accent and and were you quite were you quite did you dress quite rough um no, because I was still sort of a, you know, a modest child. But I, but I, if you listen to my accent even now, and obviously I went to Oxford and I worked in banking and all sorts of other things, there will be occasionally the sort of cockney twang comes out of it. There will be dropping a few bits and pieces that people can pick up. But you, you, re you really can play the um, I was born in a shoebox card that, that most people can't. I mean, every, everyone wants to, mm -hmm. wants to pretend that they mm -hmm. come from a kind of rougher mm -hmm. background than they actually came from. But you are well, I came from a lower middle class background. I didn't come from a working class background. I came from a work a, with no money. So an aspiring background. I really came from your typical sort of Thatcherite That's background. Right. So, so, but you're, did you see much of your parents after they gave you away to the um, care system? No, almost nothing. And I mean, the irony, of course, was they could have sent me to a government boarding school instead but they didn't know about it there was one down the road there are government boarding schools in britain yeah. where you you know and um, instead i cost the state you know the equivalent of what it would be now i suppose eighty thousand pounds a year or something ridiculous yeah. my bulimia of course got way worse because i then went into an institution where i could just eat a thousand cakes because nobody knew what i was doing yes so they failed to solve that problem and um and i mean i had a very un unpleasant experience um i was at another care home well i was also sexually abused so later i did a court case on that um what was the, what you mean? You sued the home? No, or you sued there was the a, there was a massive court case by with a um, the head of a care home that I was in had abused many many girls, and they found me and asked me to be a witness, and I ended up being the star witness because of course a lot of the other girls had ended up being prostitutes, and I was an investment banker. So, oh my God, um, did you so, win? Oh yes, we won, and he went down for many years. But they wanted me as the witness, even though I was sort of dubious about doing you that. Were, you were a credible witness. I was that, very credible. Yeah, witness. I bet you were. I bet and you were I took the judge on, of course. Did you? Well, in yes. In what way? Well, in in simple ways, like you know, I would make a comment like a few, and then he would say, "Well, you know, what is a few?" There was a very aggressive barrister, and I said, "Well, it's a small number between you know zero and four, I think." Um, you know, we had this sort of conversation, battling backwards and forwards. Right. Um, so, so that, that, and then I went to another place. So I had a, it wasn't just one care home. I went to three different places, and then when I applied the first year to Oxford, I was totally unprepared. I went to a comprehensive that got three out of two hundred and fifty people in. And the care home said, oh, you're just not good enough. You, and that was sort of like a red flag to a bull, I will be good enough. And I actually applied so for the first time for PPE, and then I changed to geography, which I knew would be easier. Right. <laughs> yeah, but that is an amazing achievement. And were you, were you aware when you were young in, this, in this, this deprived background? Were you aware that you were so much cleverer than everybody else? Was it obvious? No, it wasn't really. I mean, I knew I was, was quite bright, but I think that for many years, it's only just recently that I've actually become aware that um, 
I have gifts because I spent all my life in mathematics and numbers and about four months, five months ago I started writing literally having never written a single thing apart from say a business memo or an email and um, I've got myself in the Telegraph last week. Well don't make a habit of it, journalism <laughs> is no profession for a successful, a successful woman. I no can. but it's just a, a, it's a means to an end. Mm. So when you went you got your place at Christchurch, mm -hmm. Oxford, which is pretty much the grand, it is the grandest college, isn't it, in, in Oxford, I can confirm. Um, and you went into your first hall on the first night and you were in that dining room with a portrait of the Queen and a portrait of Henry VIII and what was it? The well, you have to realise as well, I was only the second year of women. So a woman's place is in the home, not, not the, the house. house yeah. So you had exactly. all that. And the person who went down the year before was another geographer. Um, so, but Judy Pallo was the um, was a the first female don, and she'd come from Leeds. She was a Marxist geographer, and of course, she wanted a woman. She like wanted me. you. So, when, oh, yes. so, so in the interviews, she was hungry for yes. for authentic working class. Well, I, I wouldn't say I was working class. Yeah, was but you pushed class, all the buttons that yes, she wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so she admitted you, thinking here is a little kind of a, 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 a mini Marxist. Uh, mini me yeah and 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 you've probably proved a great disappointment to her since well i was friends with her all the way up to brexit Who i were mean you? very good friends with her i mean my daughter's just got into medicine and went and worked with her husband at the, at the john radcliffe oh, right. um and i have been, taken her to nepal and visited her house and, and it, it, it is since brexit that i realized that the gulf was so enormous that we couldn't bridge that gulf well, yes. So let just go back a second. I'm, I, we're going back to that your first hall with, yes. the, with the portraits of the yeah. thirteen prime ministers and eleven viceroys of yeah. India, or is it the other way around? Who well, attended I, that? I realised. I mean that. I was a comprehensive person, so I didn't. It wasn't even just the sort of um, Bullingdon Club people, but it was the fact that. I know you went to, to public school. Yeah. It, it was a different world. There was definitely. I mean, this was. There was so much I didn't know. I mean, I think I just about knew what the Mona Lisa was, but I certainly didn't know what jurisprudence was. I had no, com I had no comprehension of the classics whatsoever. I had these enormous gaps in yeah. my knowledge that the public school people had. Well, the, the, yeah, the public schools maybe, but, but even, even in our day, I mean, you, yeah. you, you left the year before I arrived. Even then, there was quite a broad social mix. I mean, a lot of northern chemists around and stuff. It wasn't all... It wasn't all Etonians and stuff, you know. They no, but Christchurch was something like yeah, seventy well. percent. Wow. Very high. So much, so much better in those <laughs> days. I think. I, <laughs> um, but okay, so you were, you were, you were slightly overawed, but you obviously adapted very quickly. I mean, I, I'm really, really uh, not without wishing to patronise you, and you've done bloody well because after you mm, left mm. Oxford. You said you were heading a desk? No, well, I went to India for a year. Okay. Um, so I went on the Commonwealth Scholarship to India, and I was in um, Delhi when Mrs. Gandhi got killed. Um, and I, at that point, and I'd also been to post-revolutionary Iran two weeks after the revolution. So oh, I was, really? I, before I went to Oxford, I had a year where I, I mean, I was, because I ha effectively had sort of not a lot of parental guidance. Yeah. I did things that other 17-year-old girls did not do. Well, going to post-revolutionary yes, Iran? Yes, two weeks after the revolution. You had to revolution. wear the chador, I suppose. Well, no, I wore them out in Syria. I've been to Syria. I mean, I've been to Eastern Turkey. I went through Pakistan and then ended up in India and Nepal. So I did that and then worked in Jordan for a while. So before I even got to Oxford, I had um, done an enormous amount of travelling of the world. Right. Yeah. Well, what was, what was it like going into post-revolutionary Iran? Oh, it's just extraordinary because, um, I mean, the economics was extraordinary because you could buy a, um, you could fill up a, a, a lorry full of uh, petrol cheaper than you could buy a pack, a, a pack of, of, of tomatoes. But did you, did you have need to We had an armed guard. We had an armed, oh. I mean, I went on one of these overland trips. Oh, did you? Like Magic Bus. And we had an armed guard. Yeah. With who, us. Was, who, who was, well, not, not, who was your no, company? No, Top Deck. Top Deck. I know Top yeah. Deck. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, I, I went on an overland trip, but I went through Africa for yes, my, for my yes, big adventure. Yes, yes, yes. Went from, you know, uh, Cairo to Cape, yeah, effectively. Yeah, yeah. But similar deal. Yeah, yes. You, so you went on the kind of... Th the hippie trail, really. The hippie trail. And I was a hippie, and to a large extent, I mean, I, friends of mine said, I, I, I then went back and 
I joined an American banks and they said, you'll never last. You're just an old hippie. You're... And I only went into banking because I wanted to travel more and I needed some money. And I thought, well, what's the best place to get some money was to go into the city after the big bang. And of course, I realized I didn't go on the credit courses and to America. I went straight into trading and I realized, again, I went into a very male world that I was good at trading because I'm co I have a sort of lot of common sense that common sense is what is missing both in politics in the world you know the common sense is just not common this is the fundamental problem right well you, and you, you've obviously got a brain for figures as well haven't you yes yeah so so you were streetwise yeah. street smart you you had a head for figures and, and I was very hard working. I mean, that was really and very hard working. Yes. Okay, and yeah. you and I know from your ex personal experience, you're very, very pushy <laughs> in, a, in a very <laughs> impressive way. I mean, the way you pushed me to, <laughs> to make this podcast happen. And by the way, there was never any question you were you were not going to be on the on the podcast. You were, I, you yeah. were always lined up, but it was a question of when, and you yeah. just made it happen sooner rather yes. than later, which is good. And yes. I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Um, so, you got this job. Did you, did you do the milk round? You, were, you, were you visited by all these merchant banks? Oh, no, because I was in India, and so I went and, um, and I basically did the same thing as I did to you. With you my, doorstep uh, them? Um, well, I had got through to the last 20, and I basically got hold of somebody and shook him until he gave me one of those 10 places. Yeah. Right, uh, and but their faith was justified, or rather yes, their, and then their, I their well, I was headhunted at twenty-four from Switzerland. I was, by that point in Switzerland, I was headhunted to go to Merrill Lynch to head up a de desk or to join. I, they were looking for what they would call bright young things, and I was asked how much I wanted to name my price, and it would be accepted. There would be no negotiation, and so I had the weekend to name a price. No, how did you come to your price? Well, I, they got a good deal, of course. Yes, of course <laughs> they did. It's a great strategy. How, so how... What, what well, I knew what I was earning at the moment, and I want, I got double that. So but I should have asked for, you know... But it didn't make any difference. So what because, was that price? In, in, well, at in, that in, point, in, in, um, it was 40000 um, but 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 in a year, you know, I was on on bonuses because I by that point I was running uh, the people above me left, and by twenty four I was running a Merrill Lynch options desk for one of the biggest banks on Wall Street. That sounds quite a big deal. So you were earning squillions, I mean, or lots anyway. Yes, and then I went to Tokyo as well, um, and I and then I, I I took I've had other times out, but then I was uh, I worked in Singapore and a lot of time in Asia, and that was when I set up the charity and met my husband. Okay, we'll get we'll get there later yes, on, but let's, yes, let's, let's go yes. there. So you're, I, I want to hear about your adventures on Wall Street. I yeah. mean, um, did you did you party as well as work, or did you just? No, not really. You were just making money. We were some of the first people making options prices. There were no prices. So, for example, you've just been talking about Bitcoin this afternoon. You know roughly where it is. Yeah. Because you've got a screen. Yeah. But we were making things where there is no price because. There, a price, of course, is only what somebody will buy or sell. Yeah. So um, we were. It, it was the we were making things that hadn't been made before, like New Zealand dollar options. They didn't exist. Right. So we had to guess. Right. What the volatility was. We simply had to guess what the price was, and we would be proved very quickly if we were right or wrong a lot of the time. Right, I see. That so, for example, it's like the only person now in a market who really makes a price is either during a crash or, say, on a Sunday night in Singapore or New Zealand yeah. when there's been some mon mon monumental event, yeah. say, you know, Trump's got shot or yeah. something, then the person, somebody like me, will have to open the first price on Bitcoin yes. that night. Right. Okay, and it's closed at 620. Well, where is it now? 700? 500? Who knows? We'll guess. Yes, well, I, I wouldn't know whether Bitcoin would go up or down in such a circumstance. You, no. No, it's, it's quite difficult, isn't it? I mean, gold, you yes. know where it's going to go. It's going to go up. Not necessarily. Oh, really? No. Because, big, well, in, um, well, yes, I think gold would go up because I think the dollar, w the dollar would come down again in that and, experience. And, and when the dollar's up, that's not good for gold, is it? Exactly, because it's priced right. in dollars, yeah. Right, I see. That's, I, I, I mean, I, I have some very, very strong views on, but you may not want to go there no, at this point, no, on, on, on the go. markets. I mean, I called myself the little short in 2008 
because I, I you've probably heard of the, the film The Big Short yes. or the book The Big yeah, Short yeah 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 I love it I, I love mean, the book and the film from about 205 I've been saying that this was going to happen yeah but if you'd started your short positions in 205 that would have been a lot yes, of waiting yes but I and carried I had a property portfolio at that point and I sold my last house the day Northern Rock went down God, you really are and impressive. And then I said, then I got my money out of sterling and into yen. And everybody said, "Why are you doing that? That's madness. Yen's got zero percent, and sterling's got five percent." But I said, "Yes, but they've all borrowed in yen, and they're all going to need to buy that yen." And the yen went from two forty to one twenty. So, in the the, the you know two o eight was a two o seven two o eight was relatively. So you doubled you doubled your yen yeah. holdings. Yeah, correct. and. I can't. I can't even work. You see, this is this is why you're rich, or uh, well, <laughs> well, I'm not that rich. Well, you're quite rich. Well, you're not actually. You're not as rich as um, my last, the previous guest, who was the guy who invented Bitcoin, or one of them. Oh gosh. Yes. 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 Yeah. He's now he's worth definitely billions. Yes, I and, and, and of course, billions, no, though. and I'm not worth a lot, because I spent, it, I, I did things like home educated my children, took time out, Fantastic. went, well um, went um, to Nepal and married somebody earning a pound a day, um, set a check. No, 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 carry on, carry set on. A, set a charity. I took a lot of time out as well from markets because I found them quite a tedious process. And then to some extent, I have only found some fulfillment in the last few months. I've actually, since I started becoming involved in politics and writing, which I don't get paid a penny for, and it costs me a lot yeah. of money, I have finally found something that I think is worthwhile doing. Brilliant. Uh, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole. And my, I think you'll agree, a very special, a very interesting guest, Catherine. Catherine Blake Lock. More in a moment. Breitbart News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Mansour. The real thing that the left is angry about is they're like, how could you allow these Russian memes? Somebody saw a meme and then they decided they had to vote for Trump. Or it must have been fake news. And by fake news, they mean conservative websites. Come on. But this is what the left thinks. Fake news. And by fake news, what they mean is shut down Breitbart. Breitbart News Tonight. Weeknights, starting at 9 p.m. East on Sirius XM. Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special, very interesting guest, Catherine Blakelock. So, we were talking about markets, and you were amazing me with your. I don't know how, I still can't work out how you knew that, that it was worthwhile getting into yen, but whatever it was. You, you obviously got, a, got an instinct for this kind of thing. Well, I had been working in it for, for a while, and it was relatively predictable. And what is happening now in the world is also relatively predictable. Is but it? I can tell people, you can tell people what you think will happen, but most people will not take the advice. Oh, give me some, tell me what's going to happen. I'd love to hear. Well, what we've got at the moment is a glow. We've got a number of big trends happening. Yeah. The first one is a loss of confidence in governments. Yes. And that's oh. everywhere. Yeah. Duh. Why is that? I wonder. But that has really serious financial implications. On bonds? No. Yes. Oh, and interest on. rates. Right. So even without Corbyn government, we are going to face rising interest rates and we are going to face government debt crises all over the world as people decide that they don't want to lend any government money. Right. That's already started. You can see that in Turkey and South Africa and Argentina. All three of them, especially Argentina, is likely to have its 10th default. Uh, but, but, you know, Turkey is a great example um, it's example of Gresham's law. Have you heard of Gresham's law? Yes, but bad but money drives out good, is yes, that? Yes, but you know you can apply it. Obviously, it applied to coins originally, but it applies now in that the people are getting their money out, and people are getting their money out of Britain already. You realise that? No, I. D- t- so how? Right, tell me more about that. Where are they? Where are they putting it? Well, they're getting out of, obviously, I mean, even that was raised um, last week where somebody in the Labour Party had said that, um, you know, people were selling houses in London. I mean, London house prices have come down quite considerably at the top end, 15 to 20 percent already. That is a big amount, isn't yes, it? Yes, and especially if the house is worth a lot, millions. Um, and people are very fearful of a Corbyn government. So smart money, which would be, you know, the Gresham's law, the good money, yeah. is moving, already moving. Where's it going to? Switzerland? No, it's going into dollars. 
because there are two trends happening. The first one is this loss of public confidence. So America is raising interest rates and tightening. Yeah. And that is raising, that's, there's a loss of, and, but there's also shifts. While Europe is putting up taxes, and you can see it every single day. Today we had, I think, Hammond say, um, oh, all tax cuts were out because we were going to help um, universal NHS, credit. Yeah. We were going to help the NHS. We're going to have fuel. Cro so whilst Europe is pushing up taxes everywhere, Trump has been lowering taxes. And yes. so the other shift, of course, is from Europe into the US. Okay. So that's going to boost the value of the dollar. Correct. But I thought Trump wanted to keep the dollar down. Oh, he would like to. So how is he going to do that? He won't be able to. So you're saying buy dollars? Correct. I think Sell the pounds will go below one. That's quite a bold call. Yes. And I think the euro will go below its inception point, And I think that the euro will eventually break up. Yes. Oh, well, I think we all agree on that one. Well, no. that it's how it breaks up. But that, uh, oh, I see, yes. Oh, I mean, it's not obvious how it will break up because if you have peripheral com countries falling off, yeah. then the euro, the stronger bits of the euro will go up, not down. I.e., effectively, and we're already seeing this in the European bond markets where we've got these enormous, have you heard of something called Target 2? I've heard of it. Yes, I no, don't understand well, it. Target 2 basically is this sort of sloshing around. It's a monetary system that, that equalizes balances between banks at the end of the day. But the problem is that it's got to, it, it is diverging that basically Italy and Spain owe, owe Germany a trillion dollar a trillion euros. Right. And this is real money and basically money is already flowing out of those countries into Germany and the idea is that you will get redemption in Deutschmarks, not if it falls apart. So that a euro is not quite the same as a euro. An Italian euro might not be quite the same as a German euro. Right, yes. And of course, that's what breaks systems. Those type of stresses. And who will, and of course the ECB, unlike the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve, um, doesn't have, is, is run by a whole pile of countries who will then say, well, who's going to rescue this, you know? Do yeah. you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's completely different. So from who is going to rescue them? Well, the, the only people who would be big enough to rescue the ECB would be the Americans. And will they want to? Well, that's a very good point. I rather doubt under the current regime whether they will. But of course, this election and the midterms and what's going on in America are, is, is so frightening in terms of what the Democrats are doing in terms of violence, etc. I mean, they really would like to bring the democratic system down, I think. I mean, there have been one or two people, Martin Armstrong, who runs um, Princeton Economics. Um, he believes that this might be the last democratically elected president of the United States. For why? Because, because the left is going to be so... Yeah, so violent and powerful. In it, as, as you, I, I mean, you did a, a, something recently where, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, the entire media, the entire... Um, um, that everybody, the, the companies as well, and of course this is by the, for the definition of fascism, is when you have companies and, and governments working together to overturn democratic systems. Um, well, it's, it's certainly my, my view that had it not been for President Trump, America would be pretty much lost by now. I mean, had, had Hillary got in, that the whole swamp would have been running America. Um, in league with Silicon Valley. And I mean, yeah. they would all been singing from the he same hymn sheet. Yeah. Uh, Trump threw a massive spanner in the works and thank God he did. Yes, but I think it's um, unfortunately, and this is really awful, I mean, um, is, is that I think it's counter trend. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I don't think he will in the big picture succeed. And I think we're going to basically, I mean, I have absolutely, I, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't, I mean, think that things were absolutely dire. Um, I think that we, we are looking at, at appalling consequences because when we add the political violence to the economic stresses that are going to happen, yep. that's when it really gets I nasty. see, yes. It's certainly the case, isn't it, over here, for example, that the people who should have held uh, crony capitalism, sort of Ponzi scheming, Enron economics to account, i.e. the fiscally responsible conservatives, mm. Mm. actually went along with it as much as Labour did. Well, we've so got the highest tax burden since 1969 at the moment. Yeah, under a, conser under a conservative law. government. Yes, yeah. and if, if, and I mean, I was speaking to somebody 
who, who really seriously believes that Corbyn will get in, and that apparently Corbyn is already taking advice for some top accountancy firms yeah. as to how to, um, you know, basically screw the rich. And But the problem is that they don't just do that. They will go down to everybody eventually. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a likelihood, if you add this to these already public sector debts pension crisis of Armageddon proportions yeah. um, and by the way one of the reasons America is raising interest rates is to normalize the pensions because that's the driver I mean pensions simply cannot exist if they need 8% they're in government bonds yielding 1% no. um, but um, w he was talking about things like exchange controls uh, Trump was. No, so, so, if we get so, Corbyn so, so, in, we would sorry, have, yeah, yes, well, no, that's exchange a, that's controls, a given, surely. Um, it, complete obliteration of inheritance tax allowance, um, second homes will be obliterated, um, you know, and we will just go down the scale because they will be screaming for money as they won't be able to possibly raise on the bond markets. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, it could be, you know, I, I think that we look at these combinations of, I mean, it's the same as the Roman Empire. And the interesting thing, I mean, you've probably heard of um, Camellia, Camellia Paglia, have you? Yeah, yeah, I love Camellia I mean, Paglia. She, she comes to the same conclusions as I do from the financial. So you have, for example, you know, it's very interesting. I, I heard your podcast with Roger, uh, Roger Stru Scruton. Scruton. Yeah. I mean, he comes from a very sort of conservative idea. Yeah. I come from the economic. She comes from the sort of sexual. Yeah. Um, and you come to the same conclusion. It all connects. It all connects and that we're in end of civilization. And um, we have, but I look at it from the financial, that we have, if you take a 214 number from the Taxpayers Alliance, um, that every family in Britain, the debt is, and the pensions and the liabilities is 350,000. That's a 214 number. What's a 214 number? 350,000 is how much the liabilities of the government are, real, the real liabilities. Right. Per family. Oh, I see. Per British family. 350,000. That's a 214 no, so number. Okay. That government debt is, you know, is 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 nine, ten trillion and rising. I mean, there were so many pension funds, for example, the, that just don't even appear in the accounts. Are completely unfunded. Yes, I know that unfunded pensions are are, are, are the great the, the debt and, overhang. And the 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 issue is that this will cause a social crisis that is bigger than the French Revolution. You add this on top of the other crises that are going on. Yeah. And this, you know, I just don't see how you can solve it. Can you not? Can you? Can you not give me a happy ending here? Um, tell me what. Tell me what. What's how? Well, how it might be good for your business. You'll be able to run around and get. Get you know. No, I want to. I, look, my plan is to get out of journalism as soon as I can. I, I, I all I want to do is really podcast. You know, mm. podcast and do a kind of maybe a, a TV show, like a, a, a vidcast with Dick, and a few other projects. I'm, 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 I'm bored. I'm bored rigid of journalism, actually, to be yes. honest. Yeah. I mean, yeah, anyway. I think, um, you know, again, like, we're just going backtracking a second. I mean, with Trump and the same with Brexit, the, the I mean, Nigel Farage has suggested that the, the um, if Brexit doesn't happen or in a meaningful way, yeah. that the two-party system will break. Now, that was, you know, but I don't know whether that's true. I mean, but we, we could see. But I certainly think we have we have real issues, not just with debt, but with democracy. So here you are, your UKIP's economics spokesman. Mm. Um, and you call yourself spokesman, which are in the old school way, which I like. Um, you know, well before we gendered those I words. don't really it's care no, about exactly. it. That's the whole point. No, it no. just doesn't bother me. No, no real woman gives <laughs> gives a toss about that kind of thing. You're, you're, and you're a real woman. Um, I'm sorry, I was, I was looking at the the time things, checking it was still recording it. But th this 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 microphone, uh, this uh, uh, recorder has a, a, a disturbing habit of stopping for no reason sometimes. Um, so you are UKIP's economics spokes spokesman, and my heart thinks UKIP has so many of my of my values, um, but my head tells me if ever we get into a situation where UKIP is in serious play, mm. it's going to be Armageddon. 
Mm. I mean, it means that the Tories will have totally failed. The Tories, who yeah. are still our best hope of a kind of yeah, soft landing. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if your economic plan ever comes to fruition, it's going to be presumably after a terrible interregnum of Jeremy Corbyn. Well, where I, 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 think th- I think if UKIP was clever, yeah. um, and that remains to be seen... They then joined they Jeremy Corbyn. No. Well, no, but I mean, they can, they can get voters that... The Conservatives can't, especially in the northern cities. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they could actually stop, have an attempt at stopping Corbyn. It depends which sector of the population they go after. Right. Um, you know, but I think one of the interesting things, which is obviously, is is UKIP as a political pressure group yep. is quite important. For example, Very. Um, somebody in UKIP was complaining about the Conservatives having stolen one of our policies. When I said, well, I don't really care if they steal our policies. They've actually stolen the, the, the foreign aid policy, that they're going to cut it Good. last week. Um, you know, and again, I've been involved in the aid business and just seen the ridiculousness of what goes on. Um, I, I think there's a lovely. I, I'm diverging slightly here because I, I just will talk about who, what, you know, how aid works. But basically, aid in a place like Nepal always reinforces the old Etonians, because the only people who can speak English and write a report are the equivalent of the old Etonians in Kathmandu. So that's who they talk. To. So all these, all these um, people on on their kind of extended post-university gap. Years. Yeah. They, they, they go around. Well, I think in, they're doing useful things. They go around in Toyota Land Cruisers and they lord it around a bit, a bit like like the con- district commissioners in the old days, but yeah. but with a fraction of the useful. Well, I mean, no, I mean, I've been very critical of these um, these sort of gap year things. Um, I mean, basically, if you've got if you really want to help, um, you know, you you just um, give it to the bricklayer to build the school. Don't be the bricklayer. Yes, I mean, that's you know, true. These eighteen yards going to mean bricklayers, and their flight costs more than the guys at monthly salary. That's a very good point. But more than that, aid doesn't work, does it? It does it's counterproductive. It not only doesn't work, it has really negative effects. Yeah. It stops development. I mean, there's an absolute correlation between um, between countries that have received government aid and, and the ones that receive the least. Botswana receives the least. It has the best um, democracy and economy um, in Africa. In Africa. Um, Ethiopia is, ju- you know, the kids think that, the, that rice only comes off the back of a UN truck. They don't know how to to grow it Um, but it has very pernicious effects on the societies themselves especially when you reinforce the status quo and you reinforce the elite and on a different note I mean there was a wonderful example some I heard recently where um, this is in Britain and it's it's diverging slightly but um, somebody said oh look at all our workforce it's wonderfully diverse And they turned around and said, yes, but you've got all Brahmin Indians. Obviously, Brahmin being the high caste, um, every single Indian was a Brahmin. Right. And this, of course, is what we also don't understand. When we go into Nepal, we don't understand which group is in power, which group. Um, we only take pe- talk to a certain group of highly elitist, educated yeah. people. Um, here, when we have groups come... We don't understand the nuances of the 130 languages in Nepal. We don't understand that each of those groups also have a hierarchy. And so often when we do diversity in this country or supposed diversity, we are picking people just on the basis of very superficial characteristics, i.e. their Skin brown. Color. Yeah, they're brown, yeah. But not that they actually are any old, to- any old Etonian brown. And everybody we picked was an old Etonian brown because we didn't pick anybody who was from a village. Because right. of, by definition, of course, they aren't there. So where were we before we, before we, we were talking, talking about, about foreign aid? Uh, we were talking about economic armageddon. That's r- yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, so I mean, wouldn't they, we were talking about UKIP. Yes, the Conservatives UKIP's, stealing yes, UKIP's yes, economic. Yeah. So tell me about. I bet I bet you've put together a pretty good economic policy. Well, there's also, of course, an issue that's a bit controversial between what I would call the more red UKIP bits. And I more bloody blue, hate red UKIP. They're so tiresome. Blue UKIP bits, and and people seem to forget that we were formed nothing to do with, um, you know, immigration. It wasn't. We weren't formed as an anti-immigration party. We no. were formed as a libertarian small government party and right now there are no libertarians low tax small government parties it was what uh, what drove me 
sort of almost out, out of UKIP was yeah. I went to meetings yeah. and I would I would encounter people who believed everything. They could have been Lib Dems. They yeah. could have been they could have been Green. Some of them, you know, anti fox yeah. hunting. I think what's that all about? The, there were people who wanted more state intervention in 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 the economy. Yeah. They wanted industries nationalised. Yeah. And you're thinking, well. No, where is our libertarian well, I party? I mean, the funda- that is the fundamental problem. And I mean, I spent a lot of time in Singapore. Singapore is um, how I would base an economy. It, it is just always so logical. And that's what I like about it. it I mean, gosh, I think I remember going to a hustings where people were complaining about um, MPs being paid 80,000 salary. In Singapore, the average minister gets paid a million pounds. A million pounds. Do you think that would improve the standard if we paid, if we paid w- some of these, these I, SNP people? Can you uh, imagine? Can you imagine it? Imagine but how many Mars bars, deep fried Mars bars they could buy. But you get the best apply and you get the absolute brains of the country and you get no corruption because you, they can't be bought. I'll tell you what, Catherine, you'd actually get me on that salary. You would. I would be in there. I would be in like Flynn. You would suddenly have top class sound. Okay, but I want to give you a a couple of examples of of Singapore. I mean, this is just an economic example. And I calculated these. So in 1990, um, in sterling terms, the average Singaporean salary was £500 per month, average. 1990. In 1990. And Britain was 1000 Yeah. In 2018, Britain is 2000 you know average size is about 24000 and singapore is on 5000 average sterling salary 5000 so in that period in those tw- in those 28 years singapore has overtaken us and 10 more. times versus twice which is which is what happened to hong kong between yeah. the 1950s yeah under John Cooperthwaite. And has and a ta- starting tax rate of... T- I mean, most people pay about 10 or 12%. That's right, because my eldest boy is in Hong Kong. Yes. Yeah. And some Christmases, yeah. he gets a rebate. They, they, yeah. they, get, they get paid 13 months in the year yeah. to make up for the, for the tax. And sometimes they actually get money back. Yeah. But I mean, there's so... Yeah, it, it, it's extraordinary. But interestingly... Whenever, whenever I talk about John Cooperthwaite and the, and the economic miracle and, uh, of, of Hong Kong and why it is that it makes sense to have a low-tax regime, yada, yeah. yada, yada, I'm always told, yes, but it works in Hong Kong yeah. because of this or that yeah. regional uh, peculiarity. It would yeah. never work over yeah. here. Oh, we're always told that. But we're told, for example, that we can't be out of the EU because we're too small. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but Singapore's got six million people and I say, Oh my god, how does Jamaica ever survive? Or or the Maldives or where are these teeny places with hundred and fifty thousand people. Yeah, how does Liechtenstein manage, eh? Uh, yeah. It's because Liechtenstein's I mean, really poor, isn't it, yeah. right? Um but you know, there's 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 no vision um for for the country to move in a direction and there's nobody who says, Why don't we try to get rich? You know, the thing that Corbyn misses, it's not about equality, it's about fairness. Fairness is what people want. They want fairness of opportunity, not equality of opportunity. I'm so with you. And I reckon that if any politician actually articulated that, yeah. they'd get a lot of support. But yeah. nobody's, who is articulating Nobody. it? Nobody. I mean, Jacob, I suppose. But Jacob yeah. seems not that interested in pushing himself right to, the, right to the fore. Yeah, and that's why I decided that I think somebody does need to articulate it. And I came very late to politics and, and um, you know, and, that's, and, and I'm going to try in my little way to make a difference. Okay, so Catherine, in the next section, that we're going to start, but you're going to tell me your economic plan for, for the rescue of Britain, okay? Because I'm, I'm quite interested to hear it now. I'm all fired up. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special, very interesting guest, Catherine Blakelock. More in a moment. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Everything in hip hop is not bad. Kanye agreed with us, so let's love him today until he raps tomorrow and you turn your back. Because if you jump off when the fun of the moment is over, then you are in fact making Kanye the token he is accused of being. So please, don't do that. Don't go there. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. <laughs> Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special, very, very interesting guest, Catherine Blakelock. I, I, I don't know about you, special friend, special listening friend, but I think Catherine is magnificent. I'm just amazed by her energy and, and her, her hinterland. I mean, you, Catherine, you are the... 
you are a revival of the Roman tradition where people go out and, and make their money and then and learn about the world and then they come into politics, which almost nobody does these days. Yeah. So tell me about your economic plan to rescue Britain. Well, I mean, there's, there's lots and lots and lots of parts to it, but the fundamental part has to be that we, ha- we will go bankrupt if we carry on as we are. Yeah. We simply will with the pensions crisis, the NHS, and all the other things. You know, can I just tell you, you've already lost the argument because nobody's, nobody's buys into that, do they? No, and, yes. And, and what is, what is going to make them realise it other than the, the shock that's going to be too late to repair? Um, uh, or bond markets, maybe. Well, I mean, unfortunately, generally, it does take an economic Armageddon to get change. Right. A bit like Roger and, Scruton and said, depressingly, on, on, on we need a war to wake people well, up. Well, and, so, and somebody else has said, let's get Corbyn over quickly so we can have a clear out. That that has been my view here, the two, yeah. by the way. I've, in fact, I've been known to say yeah. that. Because I think, why don't the kids get a bracing taste of socialism? So they, need, they yes. know what it's like to be Venezuelan. They'll know what it is, exactly. And, and then at least we'll and have killed that generation. what we've got at the moment is managed decline. Just, just like before Margaret Thatcher arrived. Yes, literally, just managed decline, and um, so yes, if we start to have um, supermarkets empty, um, you won't be, let alone being able to go to Magaluf or whatever, you won't be able to get your money out to go. Um, we have a collapse. Um, yeah. We have the, the three-day week, um, etc. But not a three-day week because we're getting paid. We have a three-day week because we have no energy yes um, oh, because, of, because of the wonderful green energy plans yes, yeah um, then um, we will have that collapse quickly and people will, will wake up and realize there's a major problem okay. but if we assuming we don't I mean if I was it, Margaret uh, if I was Theresa May I would um, first I, w- I mean I would have sim- some similar uh, ideas to Trump um, but certainly I would want a nationalist policy that put Britain first right. I would want I mean one of the big problems uh, the, the overall riding thing is I would like to get you know taxation rates down yep. waste down government spending down yes the, it's the government spending that causes all this crony capitalism yeah. because it's who you know. I would like to get out of the EU. I would like to put a turnover tax on um, Facebook and Google. Um, would these, could you do that, do you reckon? Well, that, not in the work? EU, but if you had a free reign, you would. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, let's take John Lewis. I mean, I don't know if you heard the numbers, but John Lewis pays more in business, uh, the same double in business rates on its Oxford Street store that Starbucks paid in its total tax bill. Right, yes. Okay. and I want John Lewis to win this yes. one. Yes. Well, they're, they're paying 10 million in business rates on their store and Starbucks paid 5 million tax. Okay. Facebook, um, with uh, I think 40 billion a turnover paid, tripled its tax to 15 million. <laughs> Again, yeah. one and a half yeah. times the shop. No, by the shop. way, when we... So when people make this point, people on our side yeah. of the argument, yeah. there's always an article by some clever Oh yes, clogs, it's not free clever, markets and blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, saying, saying that actually... There's no such thing as free markets. I disagree with the IEA on this. Right. The free markets in a society which has got 50% government spending yeah. and 183,000 rules from the EU yeah. has no free markets. Therefore, it's... It's, a, it's legitimate yes. to intervene For in example, other ways. For example, I wanted to, one of the policies I actually mentioned at the speech was I wanted nobody in these quangos or universities to be paid more than Theresa May. I mean, Theresa May's paid 175000 totally. and And I even had some conservatives say, oh, you can't do that, that's free market. I said, what are you talking about? The universities of Bath, the two of them, the, um, you know, the heads of them, two universities, both get paid more than 500,000. Um, Mark Carney, 875,000. Also, they're not, they're not strictly private institutions, no, are they? No, they're, they're funded they're by the taxpayer. Yes, exactly. So, so that, that argument well, is, I mean, doesn't work The H- HS2, 600,000. Norfolk County Council, 400,000. East Anglian Air Ambulance yes. Service, 1.25 million, many people, et cetera. The number of people working on the HS2 project yeah. with salaries in excess of 100,000 is, is just yes. mind-boggling. Yes, so it's... Quango after quango after quango. Yeah. It's every government department. It's down at local county council level. We have people earning £400,000 in Norfolk. And by the way, I would take the job of being head of Bath University probably for about 75000 I'd rather like it. Uh, so would you. No, Catherine, I'm afraid to say, I think I'm, I want you as our Prime Minister. <laughs> I do. I, you would be so much better than... Well, obviously, you'd be so much better than Theresa yeah. May. You might even be up there with Thatcher. Well, let's deal with this, OK? It, it's not... The, the, then the next thing is it's not just about, about broad-stroke economics. Yeah. It's about 
lots of the taxation policies. I mean, the most simple one is raising the VAT threshold. I mean, we have businesses all over the place that stop working because they reach the threshold and they basically don't work anymore. Um, I mean, the the list of the list of micro taxation policies that you can put in place as well that are, are just detrimental to work. The other thing that I I mean, we have people on housing benefit in London who earn more than the price of a house in Hull. More right. than the price of a house in Hull. Yes. So what? What do you? So would you move them to Hull? Well, I want a certainly a strong regional policy. One of the problems we've had is that, and um, we've had this escalation of house prices which everybody in the sort of south thinks that just happened no it didn't just happen it had happened because we had these massive amounts of immigration yep. and it happened because we we gave those immigrants housing benefit yes and we lowered tax uh, we lowered interest rates to zero yes and we had qe as well and we had inflated Q asset prices. It inflated asset prices to some extent um, so the combination of all those yes, things yes. is just yes, and it's self-inflicted wounds. It's self-inflicted wounds. Um, but it's the government waste. I, I will go on to the NHS. I mean, I last yesterday or two days ago, a child, a boy, was awarded thirty-five million pounds in damages, which the NHS and the taxpayers are going to pay the bill for. So, so now, who, no, who'd the be point. For that? Well, well, the first thing I would like to do is get rid of these w no win, no fee. Lawyers. Yep. I mean, lawyers, these lawyers, I want and would like to know out of that 35 million, how much did the lawyers get? It's got to be 10%, hasn't it? I think you're way out of that. Oh, really? I think we're near, it could be nearer 40% or 50% on these no win, no win deals. Shakespeare was so right about lawyers, wasn't he? I mean, you look at the immigration cases where it's costing us half a million pounds to deport a single person yeah. because of the lawyers. Um, we have a NHS, it's the biggest bill and it's rising exponentially. I think it's 12 billion we are spending on litigation. Now, I would like to have something very simple that says, you know, you're getting a free service. I accept that we can make errors. But before you come in, yeah. you're going to sign that if you don't like our compensation schedule, which will be rather, you know, if you lose a leg, you get 50K and that's it. You're not yeah. going to get 35 million. Um, you can take your own private insurance because you're getting a free service. But I was going to say, isn't the better solution? I mean, the problem with the system is the system that... If we had a privatised system, hospitals could have their own indemnity insurance um, and people getting their treatment would go knowing that, that the hospital was insured against medical negligence cases and the taxpayer wouldn't stump up for it, the hospital would or the insurance companies would. Isn't that how it should be? Um, you know, I'm not not sure about that, and I, and I I think that you know there could be reform. I, I, one of the things I am in politics is I'm practical. I'm a yeah. pragmatist rather than an ideologue. So you know, we at the moment have the view that the NHS is a sacred cow. Um, no party wants to no, dismantle. Nobody can get away with that. No. No, right. and so therefore I would not suggest that we get rid of the NHS. Yeah, that was just me but being, being the devil. There are plenty of things that we can do within the NHS. First of all, obviously health tourism, translators. Um, I mean, very interestingly, food. I mean, it's a simple one. But if you go into hospital, and I, I, I'm actively involved in, um, you know, healthcare in Nepal, um, you... It's run by the government. I think they spend two pounds a year on health. Um, and they don't have actually that bad a life expectancy. But basically, you get slapped on a bed with no sheets, yeah. no blood, no drugs, no food, no nothing. And um, you get medical care. Right. You don't get a hotel. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, these things would be considered absolutely draconian. But, I mean, we have... Uh, the, the entire system will fail because we can't cope with this this intersection between say care and and hospital um these these and you know but the litigation for me would be the very first big one that i would take and um yeah i mean okay. i i have lots and lots but i i do think that the north and north part of the uk has been absolutely devastated um, I don't think it's, um, it's um, and that, of course, if all government, I'd like to send the BBC, well, first of all, if I didn't get rid of the BBC, I'd like to send them to Middlesbrough. I think you'd have to, say, have to get rid of the BBC, wouldn't yes, you? Yes, of course. But, um, yeah, I look at the North, and I love going to the North. Mm. I like, I, it's like going to a different country, um, not, not just in a bad way, but also people are kind of, yeah. 
they're politer, aren't they? I think, and they're 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 more they're more, you know, like well, they have more common sense. They're more old school. Yeah. Um, and I would like to see the North revitalised, but how would you do it? Uh, well, I mean, pretty simple. Well, some things are fairly simple. Um, you can have a massive lowering of council tax, a massive lowering of council of, of, of business rates. You can have VAT differentials to the north, which Italy has already done. A bit in like Margaret Thatcher's sort of special enterprise zone. Yeah, but, but you do it for you know you don't need a zone even. You can just you know take whole whole towns, whole areas. Yeah, you can have a whole uh, a, a um, line north of the Wat- anywhere north of the Watford Gap. Yeah, is gets a massive reduction in what corporation oh, you tax you can do it quite it's so simple anybody with house prices less than 208 gets it and anybody with house prices above doesn't yes I mean you know a simple thing like that um, but you know yeah um Oh, sorry. I've, 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 I've no, 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 no. I'm enjoying your, your, your economic plan. Uh, is it is it now written into UKIP policy or, or not? No, yet? I mean, I I'm, I'm still have to fight my own battles as well. Do you? Yes. What, so you mean there are factions within UKIP which want a kind of more, what, sort of statist? Yeah, and we have that we have that sort of in at the minute, which is very different from what it was originally. Um, That's so I think tiresome. It's extremely depressing because what we have at the moment, and we have no choice politically, I mean, we basically have, you know, Marxist economic disaster, complete collapse. Yeah. We have slow decline, which is yeah. left a blare. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you saw the diversity pay gap now. I mean, this yes. is just... Oh, no, they, they don't <laughs> stop inventing new shit to... to, no. to I mean, I mean, you know, uh, if I got a pile of Nepalese villagers and imported them and they'd originally been looking after goats and I got a pile of um, Singaporean physicists, I'd expect there to be a gender, a a diversity pay gap. Yeah. By definition, (laughs) obviously. There would be. Um, There would be. Um, So, um, you know, we've got that. And and we've all we've got sort of a um, sort of fringe right wing parties, which there's a variety of them all split, um, who are sort of. Um, don't like Islam with a bit of a bit of sort of Marxist or socialist policy on the on the back of it, and I want to change that. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm one of my aims of being is to change that. So, are you going to? I mean, you're not going to stand as an MP or anything. Oh, I you? did last time. I stood against Brandon Lewis, and I told Brandon Lewis. God, he's so awful, isn't he? Well, I told Brandon Lewis you'd make a dreadful ballet dancer, and I'd make a dreadful fireman, because he's been talking about diversity quotas, not about efficiency. We don't ever talk about efficiency. And if you remember when we were young, there was a book in search of excellence. We forget excellence. We yeah. forget. Um, Not on this podcast, I might tell no, you. No, but I mean, I would say go east. If you, you wanted some advice, go east, young man. Not go west, young man. Go east, because the history of the world will be written in Chinese. The Chinese do not care about diversity quotas. They don't care about green energy. They don't care. They care about making money. And they will, I, I believe Bannon is right in that respect, um, that that the real economic danger to the West is China, not, um, you know... Uh, uh, any other sort of things. I think Russia is a complete red head herring. Oh, I do as well. Um, and um, I mean, I think yes, that we we will we the, the West is just going to going to decline fairly fast. So, in terms of saving our asses mm. um, from the coming Armageddon, yeah, what do we do? Those of us who live in Britain, what what what, what measures can we take to to protect ourselves from this this horror? Personally, yeah, personally. Well, I think you need to sell assets in Europe. Yeah. I mean, all of them. Get yeah. your children out of Europe to to Asia. I think the future is Asia. I've got one boy yeah. in Hong Kong, so that's good. Yeah. So I've just got... And I think also the other thing I tell young people is think that the world will be very different. Right. Do not assume that it will be the same. Look at the changes that have occurred in our grandparents' lives, our lives. Um, learn to cook, have practical skills, do something that will be needed um, because you don't know what's going to happen and it's going to change massively. Right. So, you know, a doctor, I know there's a very few number of people, but doctors, nurses, um, you know, be a bricklayer, be a, be a plumber, be a plasterer, build a house, um, be a gardener. Um, just don't do diversity studies. No, I I met some when I when I meet the young, you know, mm. he said patronisingly. But but I I met some of the, you know, the people in their early twenties, uh, late teens at the Birmingham Conservative Conference, 
And oh, you got into trouble, didn't you? Was it no, you? No, no. Oh, who was that? Well, somebody got into trouble for an after dinner. Was it you at an after dinner? That was, at, that was at Cambridge. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, I got in trouble with Cucker. As, yes. as, as they ought to be known yes, now. Yes, for making some no, no, joke. What no. was that about? Well, a joke? Uh, yeah, I'm making a, a, a joke, but the, the jokes are verboten in, in Cambridge. And uh, look, here we are, Oxford. We're recording this in Oxford, and you and I are both kind of slightly nervous because it's not the place that yeah. we went to all those years ago. Um, and only today I read that the Oxford University Conservative Association had had passed a motion that no officer of the society could be a, can be a member of the Bullingdon. The Bullingdon, even in our day, was so marginal. It's what? It was what? Maybe 11, 12 toffs and kind of rich yeah. foreigners to, to pay the bills. Yeah. That's how it worked. They were of complete irrelevance to the rest of the university. And yet, with all the problems that conservatism, conservatism is facing in this country... That the best Alka can do is 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 say, oh, we're not. Like I don't know what has happened to the Conservatives. I mean, they are quite clearly losing the ability to think properly to yes. do stuff. I mean, they sent out emails that are sort of full of text about how fabulous things are. While the Labour Party is producing amazing videos. Yeah. Um. You know. I mean. Brandon Lewis thinks that the major problem in the fire service is our lack of diversity. Yeah. You know, at the fact that we're going bankrupt I and we can't recruit if I, if anybody. If my house is burning down, I really yes. wouldn't mind what colour they were. Yeah. I probably would would slightly mind what gender they were, actually. I think I'd rather yes. have a snapping man yeah. than a kind of little woman who'd got the job but because they have she's to, But we used petite. to be so inefficient. We have to employ two women to do the job of one it's, man. It is. It is. And the same with the army. What about the story about soldiers being disciplined yes. for sharing selfies with Tommy Robinson? Yeah. It's... The army has become a, a branch of the the social services diversity. And of course, this is industry. why you know ISIS sees the gap in the West. The of course w- they West do. is very weak. If you were in ISIS, you'd be thinking, "What yeah. do you do?" Yeah. They're making it so easy for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I d- Catherine, I'm not. I'm not sure that between us we're enough to stop this rot. You, you're pretty strong, but yeah. I'd say that. I mean, unless the, unless they really, you know, no, I, I, I think I think it, it's extra- and I think that if a right wing government or a more conservative government did get in, the violence would be appalling. I mean, we we have like in 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 we're just seeing the first signs of it with Antifa, but I don't know if you saw the Lewis Hastings. hustings. No. Um, you know, well, that was because Amory Waters and then obviously UKIP and the Conservative didn't turn up, but they were, it was violent. I mean, absolutely And of course, the, pol- the police didn't do anything. Are a chocolate fire guard, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. they? They've been, they've bought into this kind of system where yeah. they don't feel like police I, anymore. Where I really would disagree with um, many of these people who are concerned about Islam is that I just think it's a complete nut of red herring. Because the fight, which is, is, is going to be white on white, it's not going, they'll just be passing bystanders. The, the fight is between ordinary common or garden people in Mansfield and the Antifa lot. Yes. The guys who were standing in the army picture against um, some of the people that Christchurch Oxford is turning out. Yes. That's the fight. And that fight will come much quicker than, you know, all these predictions about what will happen in 2050 about Muslim demographics and stuff. Forget it. This is happening right now in Germany, on the ground, in Lewisham, in Oak, you know, in in, um, Berkeley and all sorts of other places. I think on that very cheery note, Catherine, we're going to end this podcast and we're going to kill ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the <laughs> Delling Pole podcast with me, James Delling Pole. And my, uh, that, was, that was great, Catherine. Thank you. My very special, very interesting guest, Catherine Blake. Look, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Why did we see some of the Republican kissing of Mark Zuckerberg that was taking place. I called it kissing the ring because I felt like every single person practically had to kiss the ring of this guy, you know, who wants to do nothing except get all those people out of office. So, you know, bizarre, bizarre behavior from the Republicans. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125.